Carrie, welcome to the podcast. Tell me about the first time you flew a drone. So the first time I flew a drone, I was out with uh, two of my friends from grad school and um, two of us were learning how to fly from, from the one other friend who already knew how to fly. And I had the drone in the air and everything was going good when out of nowhere, a hawk comes diving uh -oh. out of the sky directly towards the drone. So, you know, naturally I freaked out a little bit um, thinking it's going to take the drone out, but it must have realized it was, you know, something it didn't want to go after and it veered away at the last second. Um, but, you know, so I, I don't think that's the kind of thing anybody really wants to happen the very first <laughs> time they're in the air. But it's a good lesson, I guess, for, you know, what can go wrong will go wrong. What what kind of drone was that? Um, that was uh, the original Mavic from DJI. Okay. Um, so their original series, like, Way back in back, the day way back in the day yeah back in uh 2017 so. and now they're up to what mavic 8000 <laughs> it's the mavic 3 now okay yes all right well um how did you get started with all these these drones because uh you have a really cool instagram it's called unmapped earth it's all about drone stuff but you also are an expert with uas systems i guess that's you don't have to say UAS systems because the S is systems, but yeah. <laughs> you also are yeah. working with UAS in your day to day. So how did you get started with all this stuff? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think s maybe unlike a lot of people, um, I actually started using drones for research um, and data mm -hmm. collection um, where a lot of people maybe start with it as a hobby or photography or whatnot. So. Um, when I was uh, finishing up grad school, um, I went to the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, and I studied with Dr. Narcisa Procope, who had been on one of your previous podcasts. And um, She's great. Yeah. So she had um, recently started up the drone program at UNC Wilmington and had acquired the first drones there. And um, an opportunity came along to um, work under her doing some research with drones. And I sort of just just grabbed that opportunity um, mm -hmm. because they seemed really cool, right? I mean, who wouldn't want that opportunity if it was put in front of them? And um, so, you know, we started doing different types of data collection and mapping and whatnot. Um, but I've also been into photography since I was in middle school. Um, so, I mean, you know, that's at least a couple of decades now that, uh, <laughs> you know, I started out on a film camera way back in the day and, you know, eventually moved to digital photography. But I think the transition from using drones for research and mm -hmm. mapping into using them for photography was kind of natural for me. So I ended up buying my own drone, I think about 2018 um, and you know, now I would say more often than not, uh, when I'm taking pictures, it's with a drone than any other type of camera. I just prefer it. That's cool. Uh, that's what's neat about drones. You can use them in so many different ways. You know, you're talking about photography, but uh, what, what about some of the research that you were doing initially? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've gotten to work on a lot of different projects. Um, so I consider myself pretty fortunate that I've, I've had a wide range of experience. Um, so some of the initial projects we started out doing were just like testing different drones and different mm -hmm. sensors um, for mapping applications. Um, you know, if you fly at one height versus another, what does that product look like compared to the other one? Um, so we had uh, done a project doing multiple data collections with an RGB sensor and a multispectral sensor. And then we did sort of an iterative project processing in using Pix4D Mapper, mm -hmm. um, which is a photogrammetry software. Um, and, you know, we compared the outputs of what we were getting uh, based on all these different parameters that we were using. Um, so there's actually a, a publication um, that came out of that one. Um, I also worked on a project that was using thermal sensors um, mm -hmm. to study uh, endangered shore nesting birds on Lihu Taf Island. So that was probably one of my favorite projects um, with uh, my friend uh, Britton Baxley. Um, when mm -hmm. we were um, working on that project, we uh, would go out with the bird biologists from uh, UNC Wilmington, and there was someone from Audubon Society. We'd take a boat out to this island. It's an uninhabited island. Mm -hmm. You can only get there by boat. Um, 
And so our mission actually was pretty, pretty quick. Like we could do it within an hour, but the biologists would be out there observing the birds and doing mm -hmm. all, all this other stuff for hours and hours. And so we just kind of have to hang out on this island. Gotcha. For, what, what were you collecting? Uh, we were collecting thermal data. Oh, thermal. Um, okay. So they, the birds nest directly on the sand mm -hmm. um, and they were interested in, you know, if, if there's any, specific temperature and substrate uh, mm -hmm. that they prefer as to where they're nesting. Um, but a large part of what we were doing in that initial phase of the study was trying to design a flight that would minimize the impact to the birds um, because mm -hmm. the drone we were using, it was um, a SenseFly EB+. Plus. Um, so if you've seen this one, it's basically... Um, it's made of styrofoam. It's a fixed wing drone. Mm -hmm. When it flies, it looks very similar to a predatory bird. So every time we put <laughs> it up in the air, right, all these birds would get startled. And yeah. um, the biologists were concerned that they would abandon their nests and abandon mm -hmm. the eggs on their nest. Um, so we were trying to minimize that, uh, you know, with different flight altitudes, um, different flight patterns. And what we ultimately ended up doing with that one was having to camouflage the majority of the drone by um, turning it blue like the sky. So when okay. you were looking upward, um, it was mostly camouflaged into the sky and breaking up that outline that made it look like a bird. Um, so how'd you do that? Just paint? Or? Uh, so it was a combination of um, blue paper and tape and paint. Yes. So <laughs> yes. yeah, very and, technical. Uh, yeah, yeah, we've we've gotten um, into some you know creative approaches, I guess, to um, you know making the drones do what we need them to do. Um, so Britain, as I was mentioning one time, had designed um, a mount for the uh, DJI Phantom to mm -hmm. hold a multispectral sensor that um, was actually made out of Legos and zip ties. Yeah. So, so yeah, <laughs> that was that That's was pretty, pretty cool. Um, yeah, you have to get creative. I mean, you know, yeah, we've we've um, you know attached sensors to drones that are not made mm -hmm. to be attached to, but. Um, you can do it with a little bit of ingenuity. So, well, aside from being great to step on, that sounds like a great use case for Legos. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what, what are some of the other ways that you've used drones uh, overall? Um, so, I've used drones a lot uh, for vegetation analysis. Okay. Um, so, I'd say that is probably you know one of the the stronger suits. Um, so, if it's quantifying, um, you know how much vegetation, how healthy it is. Um, so using multispectral sensors, you can create a variety of different indices by combining different bands from the multispectral mm -hmm. sensors um, and make vegetation indices. Um, Could you maybe describe that a little bit, like how, how that actually works um, using multispectral imagery? Sure. Um, so the, the multispectral sensor is mm -hmm. collecting light of different wavelengths. So some we can see and some mm -hmm. we cannot see. Um, so infrared, you know, be, being one that we can't see. And that is um, pretty important in a lot of the vegetation indices um, that you're building. Um, so when you're working in your GIS or remote sensing software, you can, you know, add or subtract or do different mathematical functions on these bands mm -hmm. essentially to create these indices. Um, and that will highlight different aspects of the vegetation. Um, so the NDVI or normalized difference vegetation index is a really common one mm -hmm. um, that is used to show vegetation health. Um, and so where, where did you learn to do this? <laughs> Where did I learn to do? So I all of this I learned while studying for my master's degree. And I okay. would say um, afterwards, um, after I had graduated, I stayed on working at UNC Wilmington for a couple years under mm -hmm. um, Dr. Procope. Um, and so through some of the research projects I worked on with, with her, as well as I was teaching some courses at the university, mm -hmm. um, GIS and remote sensing oriented courses. So cool. um but what's also interesting about drones is that not only can you you do you have flexibility across um, use cases, but across industries as well, right? Like you, like in the, on the military 
side of the house. Military drones are a little bit different, right? They're high altitude, you know, long dwell times for the most part, um, depending on their payload. And they're used for all sorts of stuff. They're used, you know, to put warheads uh, on foreheads, as we say. Uh, but they're also used for surveillance. They're also used for, you know, humanitarian purposes. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a really, really neat and interesting career field that you're in. Um, what are some of the other ways that you use drones professionally? Like what are, what are the, some of the use cases and markets that um, you look to extract information from? Absolutely. For? Um, I mean, I, I guess that is one of the really cool things about drones and, and all the different sensors is that you could probably apply them to anything you could think of. Um, but specifically in, um, you know, land development and construction, they're being used a lot um, to create really accurate uh, topographic models. Um, so for developers who are designing neighborhoods or, mm -hmm. you know, facilities or whatnot, um, having, you know, a good understanding of what that ground actually looks like, um, you know, over the entire surface as opposed to, you know, traditional uh, surveys which have to be done, you know, by a human and, um, you know, walking around and taking measurements. Um, and, you know, ideally you want to combine the two Mm -hmm. to get the best product. But I think the drones, you know, give a, a good um, large area picture. Um, how, how are you collecting that topography? Uh, so, so there are multiple ways you can do it, but I think probably the, the preferred way now is using mm -hmm. a LiDAR sensor, um, okay. which a LiDAR sensor is um, a little bit different from other sensors, whereas, whereas you know, camera-based sensors are just collecting incoming mm -hmm. Um, wavelengths of light. The LIDAR is actually an active sensor. So it's sending out a signal that is, it's a laser pulse, mm -hmm. everything it bounces off of, it collects that measurement and sends it back to the sensor. So you're building these really detailed and accurate three-dimensional models of whatever you're imaging. So, so, you know, be that a forest or, you know, a plot of land, it could be buildings, um, and and those you know can use to be do to um, create three D reconstructions mm -hmm. of any type of scene. Um, and so you know a lot of a lot of industries are interested in that. Um, if you've heard the term digital twin, mm -hmm. um, you know people from you know city government, private business alike, um, you know are just generally interested in having these three D reconstructions. Um, that can be used for okay so you so you build you build a topographical map and then how are the engineers using that like what is it going into their plans are they building other maps and models on their end like what what are the engineers doing right so you know i'm not an engineer so <laughs> i can't you know necessarily speak to exactly right. what they're doing but um you know a lot of uh you know, what we do on the GIS end um, has to be converted over into CAD format, which is okay. what engineers typically work in. So if we um, create, you know, say contour lines mm -hmm. in our GIS, we can convert that into a CAD format. They can bring those contour lines as they're thinking about the placement of, mm -hmm. you know, say a neighborhood, right? Like where do they want to put the buildings? What features might they have that they can't build on like waterways or, you know, uh, are there any stands of forest there they want to preserve? Are there large trees there that they want to preserve? Um, but as far as, you know, the specific things that engineers are doing, I have no idea about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, what are, what are some other ways you can use that thermal sensor that you talked about? Um, like, uh, you know, from a military standpoint, we use, we don't really say thermal, we say infrared, right? Yeah. But um, it's all the same stuff. Um, we usually use that for one to see at night. I mean, that's just the obvious use case for it. Um, but two, to, to recognize thermal signatures, to recognize where things have been. We can see things that are running and aren't running. Like if we're looking at like an IR video, mm -hmm. um, you can see if, AC units are on at a house or something like that. You know, what are some of those different use cases, uh, maybe on the civilian side for uh, infrared imagery? Yep, absolutely. Um, so I think search and rescue is mm -hmm. um, probably one 
that is being utilized a lot nowadays um, because you can, you know, have live feeds of mm -hmm. sometimes simultaneously thermal and, you know, visible spectrum. Um, so if there's a, a natural disaster of any type and they're looking out there to see, you know, look for people, um, perhaps they could be used, you know, in, in a sense for surveillance um, if you're, you know, trying to locate uh, locate someone who's mm -hmm. like maybe a dangerous suspect or whatnot, um, as well as, you know, other uses like tracking wildlife. Um, so obviously, you know, animals as well are putting off a heat mm -hmm. signature. Um, so wildlife biologists can use them for tracking, um, you know, quantifying different populations of animals. Um, Another use case that we're coming across pretty frequently is um, doing inspections for, uh, you know, like the power industry, the mm -hmm. electric utility industry. Um, so a lot of their infrastructure, um, you know, if something is going wrong, you know, it could be, uh, you know, too hot or too cold and you can pick up on those anomalies um, from the imagery. Okay. So you're reliant on... One, there being a temperature difference, right? To be yes. able to, to pick those things out. Um, what are kind of the limitations of of some of these sensors? You know, um, when you're working with low altitude ish drones, I mean, what mm. what what can you fly? At 400 feet or something like that? Yeah. So uh, t typically 400 feet above ground level. Okay. Um, if there's a building, you could fly 400 feet above that building. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that is one of the, the limitations, obviously, is the, the ceiling um, limit to which you can fly. Um, although with a lot of the sensors, you'll start to lose your resolution once mm -hmm. you go beyond that anyway. Um, the sensors that we're using on the civilian side, I think don't always quite have that capability of the right. military sensors, right? So typically the lower altitude flights are what you want anyway, mm. because you're trying to maximize the detail, um, that you're getting. Um, but I think one of the, you know, most most pressing challenges is that you also have to keep it within line of sight, right? So, and that's a little bit ambiguous as to yeah. what that actually means. Um, but, you know, you generally want to have eyes on the drone or mm -hmm. have that, you know, within your field of view. Um, and that's, you know, a legal aspect as well as a communication, um, right. you know, aspect between your controller and the drone. Um, if you send it too far out and you lose communication with the drone, you know, then you can obviously right. have, have issues with losing your drone. Um, but it certainly poses a limitation, mm -hmm. you know, on how far away from your base you can collect data or if you were doing, you know, search and rescue, you may have to have that person with the controller, you know, move along with right. the drone in order to cover large areas. Yeah. Uh, is it just me or is everyone getting their drone drone license now? That, <laughs> yeah. that part 107 <laughs> license, Absolutely. it seems like they're giving it out like hotcakes. Yeah, no, I, I think a lot of people have it. Um, and it's definitely a useful, um, you know, useful cert to have, even if you're just starting out um, kind of as a hobbyist mm -hmm. um, where, you know, you can fly a drone legally without having the part 107. Um, right. But I think having the part 107 will give you a more thorough understanding of the legal aspects right. um, that come along with flying a drone, as well as if you ever want to commercialize your hobby, right? So if you're a drone photographer and you decide you want to make mm -hmm. money off of that, you do need to have the 107 in order to be paid for what you're doing. Um, I think there's probably a, a lot of people out there, you know, kind right. of doing that you know, off the record <laughs> and, you know, they don't have the 107. Um, is anyone coming for these people though? Um, Nobody's coming for these people, right? Well, I ha I actually have seen, um, you know, oh, really? incidents mm. like where the FAA has come after unlicensed drone pilots. Um, I don't remember the guy's name specifically, but he was from Philadelphia and that was a fairly high profile one because the FAA ended up finding him like hundreds of thousands of dollars for um, unlicensed operation of a drone. And he was flying it like downtown Philadelphia over heavy traffic, people, and, you know, all different you're not, types of You're not of supposed stuff. to fly over people, right? You are 
most cases, you should not be flying over people. There are um, new regulations where certain mm -hmm. drones that have covered propellers can fly over people. Um, but I think most of the common drones that people own, mm -hmm. being like the D DJI, you know, Mavics, Airs, Minis, right. and stuff that have the exposed propellers, should not be flown over people unless the people are consenting to be flown right. over, right? So um, they say that. Um, but you know, other other types of models, which would not really be hobby models, I guess, like the SenseFly EB, mm -hmm. right? So that's a styrofoam fixed wing drone. Um, it doesn't really have, you know, the exposed propellers that could hurt people. Um, right. But yeah, so. So as a pilot, I just like to say, <laughs> I did, I did yeah. take the test. I yes. passed it on my, on my like, first try. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know you passed it well, well before me. Um, why, why does that test have nothing to do with actually operating a drone itself? Because there's no questions on there about, how do you take off and land? I don't know. That's probably an important thing to know if you're flying something. Yeah. So, I mean, they do cover kind of flying and performance, but I think a lot of that is more like environmental factors that could go into uh -huh. it, right? Or, you know, they cover like people, clouds, people's attitudes <laughs> of, you know, like yeah. they have these like hazardous attitudes. Um, I don't really know. I mean, it's, it's interesting that there is no practical application. Right of that, um, where you can be a part 107 licensed pilot and literally never put your hands on a drone. Right. Um, so, you know, I don't know if I just hope <laughs> actual real pilots that fly actual real airplanes oh, right. <laughs> have a test that requires them to actually fly the plane, understand the plane, Absolutely. understand the rules and all that stuff, of course, but Let's be real. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe it's something that's coming in the future. You know that the FAA is going to start requiring. They should that, change but. the name from drone pilot to drone operator or something because it's not a pilot. Let's yeah. be real. Yeah, <laughs> but it's that's all right. Yeah. Um, I know there's some Air Force people out there that fly drones that would probably have a problem with what I'm saying. <laughs> um. But they fly, you know, military style stuff. Yeah, you know? yeah. big stuff. I know. It's, it's different. not like a you know tiny little. Yeah photography drone so yes. you mentioned a bunch of different models of drones there uh which one's your favorite and why oh gosh yeah i think it's kind of a two-part answer to that because okay. i have i have favorites you know in terms of the data collection aspect and then i have favorites in terms mm -hmm. of the photography aspect um so for photography what i'm using right now is the dji mavic 3 um and that is it's not their top of the line Mavic model. They have like a slightly better um, mm -hmm. Mavic Three model out there, but it's it's really great. I mean, you're you're shooting above 4K. Um, you know, it has a really high resolution camera on it. Um, and one of my favorite things is the connectivity between your remote control and your drone is a lot better than the previous mm -hmm. models that they had. Um, cause I think there's really like no worse feeling than losing connection with your right. drone while it's in the air. Um, <laughs> you know, and a lot of times you can, you can get that back, but what if you can't, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so with, with, um, the Mavic three, I've found, um, you know, I never lose connection, even if it's, right. you know, being obscured by, you know, something momentarily or, you know, it's, it's further away. Um, and then from a mapping aspect, um, I was always really partial to the EB. Um, mm -hmm. I think that is a really great drone for large area mapping. Um, and it can take a variety of different sensors. It has like multispectral, thermal, mm -hmm. RGB sensor. Um, but we've recently started working with the Matrice 300, um, which is uh, it's a rotocopter style drone that's that's made for mapping as well. Um, so it's definitely bulkier than the EB, right. um, but it is a great drone. I mean, and you can hold different sensors on it as well. Um, so LIDAR, thermal, mm -hmm. you could put a multispectral RGB, really anything on there. Um, or I think the EB, you can't do, you can't do LIDAR from the EB. So that's a definite limitation of that. Um, and with LIDAR becoming increasingly utilized across yeah. a lot of different industries, um, you know, I think anyone who's looking at starting up a drone program definitely needs to take that into consideration. Um, but again, you know, with the caveat of 
everything I'm talking about, you know, mostly is um, DJI drones, which we know right. there's there can be issues with that as well. Um, in 2020, the DOI put a ban on using DJI mm -hmm. and other foreign-made drones on on their properties, um, and so now there's a lot of models that we're seeing coming out that are on what's called the blue UAS list. Yep. And those are models that have been cleared by the federal government to be used, you know, on federal properties and federal projects and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and so I haven't, you know, directly been able to get my hands on a lot of those um, um, yet, but I'm, I'm always very interested in, right. you know, trying every kind of drone that's out there that's possible. What are, what are your thoughts on the blue UAS list? Because, Let's be real, DJI is, in my opinion, they're way ahead of all of these other manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And it seems like we're severely limiting what we can do just to say, well, this thing's not made in China or something when almost everything we have is made in China. Um, I don't know. What are your thoughts on just that security pragmatism versus using the best technology for the job, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm really all about, you know, if we, if we did have, uh, you know, an American made drone mm -hmm. company, um, I feel like that would be the way to go. But I think, you know, obviously, like you said, DJI kind of is on the forefront of a lot of things. And I think a lot of the reason for that is because they had a good product and everyone in industry got behind them initially. Right. Right. So they had a lot of backing and they had a lot of, you know, income coming in with people buying their mm -hmm. products. And I don't think we've seen that same thing yet with, right. with American companies. And even some of the drones that are on the blue UIS list are foreign companies that have just been cleared, right. um, you know, right, right. um, based on certain parts or whatnot that's used in them. Um, you know, they, they make the list, but I think what we would really need to see is kind of that industry backing of, you know, mm -hmm. w one company really that's going to just, you know, go go all in and kind of be able to go, you know, right. put put out these top of the line, um, you know, products like DJI has been able to. Um, and then hopefully that would, you know, give us give us some options that are a lot more integrated because right. now it's kind of like, you know, separate companies. It's like, OK, do you want a fixed wing drone? You sh can buy it from, you know, this company. You want a quadcopter? You can get it from this company. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, there are some companies out there doing really great things and they have great products, um, but it's just not quite where industry has kind of backed right. anyone specifically yet. You see a lot of information about, out there about Skydio, mm -hmm. which is made in the United States. Uh, I went to a demo, and the demo is great. I mean, they, they were able to do some automated 3D mapping, which was really cool. Um, but you couldn't swap out the sensors. Mm -hmm. Their program for how you actually pay for the drone is silly. They wanted you to buy a subscription to the software, and then they would send you the drone. I, it was some silly thing like that, you know? Um but I'd like to see a good American manufacturer make something cool in the United States and everyone get on board with it. I'm with you there. That'd, yeah, be, that'd be something. Yeah. Um, what are some of the emerging and kind of interesting ways drones are being used right now um, and maybe other areas you're interested in? Um, I mean, I think there's so much coming out that it's, it's even kind of hard to pinpoint something. Um, but I think maybe something like medical delivery, right, mm -hmm. is is pretty innovative. Um, and that has been kind of piloted throughout North Carolina um, in, in a couple different areas. Um, but using a drone to deliver critical supplies, you know, right. at, at a quicker speed, um, even, you know, on, on the same hospital grounds, really, I mean, that could mm -hmm. save lives in the end. Um, I think also, um, you know, autonomous vehicles, um, like flying vehicles, right? Not, right. not, uh, you know, like Teslas or whatnot. Um, but, but people are looking at that a lot. Uh, you know, if you're talking about like urban air mobility, right, is normally the term right. you'd see associated with that. Um, and so, I mean, things exist out there and I think we're a long way from seeing that, but, you know, it's kind of cool to think about like future cities maybe are going to have mm -hmm, these, mm -hmm. you know, essentially drones that can carry people around in them, um, you know, or supplies or, you know, Amazon is doing drone delivery now. It's not um, what they did in the Jetsons. They just yeah. hopped in the little thing and they, <laughs> Yep, you know? absolutely. 
Absolutely. Uh, okay. Uh, what are some other areas you think are interesting? I, d- doesn't Walmart have a program where they're yeah, doing? Yeah, I think Walmart as well is doing is doing delivery. Um, okay. You know, and I don't know. I mean, for something like that, I don't know that we necessarily need to get, you know, whatever we've ordered from Amazon or Walmart in like a matter of hours via drone. But oh, no, who knows? Oh, no, if, <laughs> if some, you some want your impatient. So if, if you're aching for those Pringles, absolutely, you, know. you can get them. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I live in kind of a rural area. So normally like my delivery time is always like plus one day to yeah, whatever yeah. anybody else's. Or, you know, if I want to go to the store, it's like a 30 minute drive. So mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm not quite in an area where I'd be eligible for that anyway. I've kind of gotten used to, you know, having to having to wait for what I want. But, um, you know, certainly in cities, um, if that becomes a way to limit the amount of traffic on the road, you know, right. and that could have a positive environmental impact. Mm-hmm. Um, I could see that, you know, that may be a direction we want to pursue in the future. Are you are you paying attention at all to what's happening in Ukraine in terms of how these small UAS systems are being used basically as weapons and bomb droppers. If you go Mm -hmm. on any of these social media apps or even on Google and you search, you know, drone bomb or Ukraine drone or something like that, you'll get a video of a small UAS system flying around and you'll see it drop. They're just dropping bombs on, on Russians and, and their fighting positions and whatnot. Um, what do you think about that? I think it's the first time we've actually seen small UAS systems used. They've been used in combat for a while, but not to this extent. Like right, you just, where they're, just they're thousands of them. Essentially, yeah. Yeah. I I mean, I don't want to say it's smart, but I you know I think it's logical that that people would go right. this direction because you know they're small, they're portable. Mm-hmm. You can fly them long distances and. You know, if if ultimately on your side, you're saving lives Mm -hmm. by removing the person even further from, you know, where where that target is, um, I think from a military and strategic perspective, it makes sense. Right. Are you paying attention at all to this this uh, MQ-9 drone that apparently was knocked out of sky by the uh, by the Russians? Um. I'll read an article. This is from C4ISRnet. Uh, it says, An American intelligence drone splashed into international waters this week after Russian fighter jets intercepted, harassed, and ultimately careened it into the Black Sea near Ukraine, U.S. defense officials said. Uh, and then it says, um, This was done by two nearby Su-27 jets uh, around the same location this happened on March 14th. I don't I don't know. What do you call it? if if somebody downs your drone, first of all, you're angry, right? Uh but <laughs> second of all, you know, is that an act of war? Like, you know, yeah, I don't know. I think there's a lot of gray area, right? Because right. Russia's perceiving the presence of our drone there as a threat to them. Mm-hmm. They're they're doing what they're doing, which then we're perceiving as a threat. Um, so yeah, I mean it's kind of it's kind of interesting, um, and I think that's a kind of controversial space right there. Um, and I'm just interested in following the story, I guess, to see where it goes because you know both Russia and the U.S. are talking about trying to possibly recover um, the drone and. <laughs> From what I've read, you know, it's maybe like a thousand to four thousand feet of water or something like right, that. Luck. So, you know, in the U.S. says that they've basically destroyed whatever mm-hmm. was on board that would carry any type of sensitive information. Um, but you know, what if Russia gets right. their hands on it? Right? I mean, they're getting an inside look at our technology and you know, possibly intelligence. So, um, you know, I just. Mostly I just watch, you know, at this point and see what happens. Um, Because if they can, if anybody can pull it up from the bottom of the ocean like that, I'd be, I'd be at least a little bit impressed, I think. Yeah. Uh, Well, if anybody can do it, it's us, right? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You you talked about, uh, you know, mapping topography, some use cases for inspections and engineering. Um, What are some of the other areas that are interesting to you um, to use drones in? 
Absolutely. Um, so I think my my background, you know, with drones and GIS in general has largely been focused on environmental applications. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm really interested in how they're being used to study coastal environments. So if that's, you know, shoreline change or coastal flooding mm -hmm. caused by storms, hurricanes, right, which is a huge, you know, impact in this area where it seems like every couple of years, you know, mm -hmm. we're getting a major storm coming through here. Um, so I think that that technology um, will allow us to collect real world data um, that's going to help us better understand the impacts of that on, you know, our communities and the physical landscape, um, as well as, uh, you know, water quality issues. Um, so so thermal sensors have been used um, for looking at different water quality issues where you may have, um, you know, inputs coming into your waterways that you're not necessarily aware of. Um, if there's, you know, illegal um, pipes like discharging water gotcha. um, into, into um, you know, your streams. And we've had our fair share of, you know, water quality issues in this area as well right. with the Gen X, um, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. yeah. debacle that went on several years ago. Um, so I think, uh, you know, drones are very interesting in that aspect that we're able to look at some phenomena that are happening, um, you know, with, with, you know, a new light, if you will. I mean, things that we can't see with our naked eyes um, can be seen with drones. Um, I'm also really interested in how they're being used in vegetation assessments, right? So, I mean, this can be, you know, anything from studying, you know, agricultural yields of crops to looking at invasive species. Mm -hmm. um, so one project that we've been working on with NCDOT and I've been involved with since 2019 um, is actually um, a pretty unique project because it's taking place in a national park, um, the Cape Hatteras National Seashore. Um, and so uh, most people who fly drones are, you know, familiar with the ban on right. launching and landing drones in national parks. Um, so this is actually an approved project, which makes it kind of unique because I'm only aware of one other project um, mm -hmm. where the National Park Service has actually allowed a drone to be used other than like search and rescue that they're doing internally. Um, but drones are being used there to study an invasive grass called Phragmites um, mm -hmm. that NCDOT is trying to um, get rid of the grass or do, do a mitigation of that grass. So using a combination of multispectral um, and RGB imagery to detect and quantify where the grass is, um, and as well as they're using drones to do the herbicide application. Mm, um, okay. And so this is the area where the grass is growing. It's like a marsh, and it's really not somewhere you want to be walking in, right? Like the grass sure. is like... I know it's very stabby, I guess, if you will, <laughs> like it's just, it's a very tough kind of, tough kind of grasses are growing out there. It's muddy, you know, you go out there in the summer, like there's bugs yeah. and it's just not really great. So, um, you can have certain drones that actually carry like a tank on them and you can mm -hmm. just have them go out there and distribute the herbicide. So I think all around, it's a really, um, a really cool project, how they have integrated drones, you know, from analyzing it into, you know, kind of mm -hmm. the mitigation end of things as well. Uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, you know, you hear a lot about precision agriculture with drones. Mm -hmm. You know, can you maybe talk about that just a little bit? I know you're not a precision agriculture expert, but I'm just kind of curious as the what what that exactly what does that mean? You know? Yep, exactly. So um with precision agriculture, you would you would use uh, you know, drones, so multispectral um, would be a really common type of, of sensor you would use to study um, the crops and the soils that are there. Um, and you can look at kind of on a fine scale, your crop health. Um, and so, you know, maybe like this one patch over here isn't doing so well, but mm -hmm. this one patch is doing a lot and better. And just so I understand this, so you're, you're flying with a multispectral sensor and you're just tell me if I'm getting this wrong. And you're isolating the bands of light to determine plant health. Yes. All right. I'm missing something there. Like, what, like, how are you able to look at a plant, right, with a certain band of light and tell whether it's healthy or not? I mean. Yeah. So plants will absorb and reflect light um, 
you know, as, as a function of just their physiology and, you know, mm -hmm. plants have chlorophyll, um, and that's how they're performing, you know, a lot of their, their functions. But so they're primarily, you know, it's red and infrared light, um, mm -hmm. is what's used in the NDVI, which I was talking about earlier and the, the ratio, um, essentially the ratio that they're, you know, reflecting or absorbing this light, um, can be used to, as a measure of how healthy that plant is, or, okay. you know, that patch of plants or whatever. Um, so they'll, they'll reflect and absorb differently. Um, and you can, you can pick up on that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, with areas that maybe, you know, are not, not doing as well, that would indicate, okay, maybe we need some more fertilizer over here, or, right. you know, maybe we need some more water over here. Um, and so, so, you know, on the farming end, I mean, the machinery is very high tech too, right? So you have mm -hmm. these tractors that can just go out and, you know, automatically distribute fertilizers or whatever else they're using. Have you, have you um, seen that, that one uh, piece of equipment? What it does is it, it goes over um, farmland and it uses computer vision algorithms to isolate weeds and it burns them. It uses oh. lasers to burn them. It's really cool. So if you if you go on YouTube or search for this, you know, um, it, it's it's going over the plants. And as you see it moving along, you just see the lasers going dzz, 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 because the computer vision algorithm is able to determine what's a weed and what isn't. It even crazier. It remembers every single plant. Remembers right. Mm -hmm. It stores each plant in its database, so it knows. Hey, this is this doesn't belong here, right? This, I saw this plant last time. What's this thing here? And then it says, Oh, is this a weed? Yep. And then it zaps it, hits yeah. it with a laser. So this is a, some really cool technology with agriculture. Oh, it's, it's pretty amazing, you know, kind of how mm -hmm. far it's come from people just being out there with a plow and a donkey, you know, just right. like killing <laughs> up the ground. Um, and you know, now, we're literally integrating AI into right. how we're doing our farming. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it is. And, really that, and that's actually one of the big reasons why John Deere is investing in satellites or satellite companies. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, who would think that those two things would go together, but you know, they want to be able to provide better value to their farmers. So they invest in, you know, satellite imagery companies, right? There's a lot of these commercial satellite companies now. Um, so it's pretty cool to see a company like John Deere investing in, into this remote sensing space. Absolutely. Uh, so it's pretty neat. Well, yeah, in the same way that, you know, drones can be used to, you know, study mm -hmm. crop health, you could as well just use satellite imagery for that. And, you know, it's not going to be as fine resolution. Right. But if you have, you know, really large properties, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, a lot of the farms in the Midwest are these big mega farms now, um, you know, having access to that kind of data on large scale is, is pretty right. incredible for them. So we were just at that North Carolina GIS conference. What are your what are your thoughts on the state of GIS remote sensing usage of drones in uh, North Carolina? I I think people have a lot of cool ideas um, for how they would implement them. Um, with a, with a lot of the people that we talked to at that conference, they're sort of um, you know local or state GIS people, county GIS mm -hmm. people. Um, I think they're very limited by budgets, um, is, is, you As know, you tend to be <laughs> exactly. So, you know, I talked to people who said, oh, you know, we're from parks and rec and we do planning and we want to use, you know, LIDAR on drones to study the erosion in our parks so we can do better right. planning to mitigate that, but we don't have the funding for that. Um, you know, so I think you know, there's, you bring up an interesting point and the point is. I see a lot of these postings for people to go collect drone imagery. It'll say, you know, bring your drone, come collect this hundred acres. The pay is a hundred dollars uh, because yeah. I follow, I follow <laughs> some of the drone groups on like Facebook and, and Reddit. Um, does, do people have any idea how much this stuff costs? Like the time, the planning, Gosh, yeah. the processing so, that's involved? I mean, there so there are some companies um, that kind of crowdsource their data collection mm -hmm. or, you know, drone photography or whatnot. And um, I've, I've looked at several of them, you know, and it's just like you say, like you see this job pop up and it's like all you need is, you know, a Mavic 2 and Pix4D Capture and you can go out here and, you know, collect this data and then just send it to us and we'll process it. And we're going to give you $60, but <laughs> it's two hours away from your house, right. you know? So then I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, okay, 
like, you know, I'll be two hours in the car, the mission probably going to take me 30 minutes to an hour, two hours back, right. $60. I'm like, I've made $12 an hour. <laughs> um, right. So, you know, maybe if you're in a populated area and there's a lot of jobs popping up, like that could be feasible. But um, I think for the average drone pilot, uh, that's it's not a way to sustain anything. And especially right. when you get into the more expensive technology, you know, when you're flying a larger platform like the M300 with a LIDAR sensor, mm -hmm. you know, and you're literally tens of thousands of dollars in on your equipment and, right. you know, you're using RTK technology to get this high accuracy data. Um, so yeah, sometimes people's, you know, expectation of what they should pay versus you right. know, what it actually costs, I think, is a little bit off. But the price has come down a lot mm -hmm. um, considerably, you know, especially on the LIDAR side, whereas, you know, that kind of used to be unattainable for a lot of people who'd be interested in having mm -hmm. LIDAR data. Um, it's pretty affordable now. Al know, along that same lines, I saw something the other day that somebody had built a developer kit to fly your iPhone using the iPhone's LIDAR and collect your LIDAR data that way um so it's pretty creative i mean absolutely if 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 it's got a lidar sensor why not use it i imagine that's probably not the proper use case for the phone <laughs> it, yeah um, well i mean i think it's it's definitely innovative mm -hmm. and i think for projects where you're just maybe trying to get uh you know some context or understanding mm -hmm. of, of what's there and you're not necessarily looking for high accuracy right. that would be required for like survey grade or engineering mm -hmm. projects um, it's pretty awesome, right? right? I mean, that a phone could do that now. Yeah. I imagine the point density wouldn't be very good if you're flying with your iPhone yeah, 13. <laughs> probably not. I mean, you could probably figure out a way to maximize it, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, I, I've not ever seen, you know, uh, the data coming off of an iPhone 13, <laughs> but I, I definitely be curious too. Yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting that, the way that Elon Musk's approach to driverless cars is he only wants to use visual sensors. He doesn't want to use any microwaves or x-rays or LIDAR sensors or anything like that. Everything is based off of um, visual sensors because this is the way we designed our roads, right? And it logically it makes sense, but when I look at what LIDAR can do and I look at what these other sensors can do it's kind of like well why 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 limit it to mm -hmm. our to our human senses you know yeah no i mean and i think that's where you know sometimes you get the most information is by fusing multiple mm -hmm. sources of data um you're going to get a more complete picture right um you know and i've i recently uh rented a tesla and was driving in one i mean it does pretty good but yeah. i definitely did notice like some some things it was missing on picking up and of course you know you did you do the driverless like no trip no thing? so i think they had disabled it because uh, it's a rental vehicle but you know well, what's the fun in that isn't that the know, whole point of renting it curious you so you know? can sleep and um, <laughs> exactly like go on your drive and take a nap but which you know you're still you're supposed to be alert at the the steering wheel anyway so i don't know um i probably won't get a driverless car until i can actually take a nap in the back and just let it go but I'm with um, you. I'm yeah, with you. Yeah. Sign, sign me up. Yes. <laughs> if I can take a nap in the back and this car drives to California or something. Absolutely. Or, yeah, I mean, if I could, you know, sit in the back and get my work done, I might actually come into yeah, the office you every day. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> might not be a bad reason. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that hawk attack at the beginning. Yes. Do you have any other interesting or cool stories about these drone field trips? Uh, yeah, well... I think that's one thing you learn if you're in the industry long enough mm -hmm. is that eventually you will have a crash, right? Or you will uh -huh. have an incident. Um, so it's just kind of how you deal with it in that moment. Um, there's nothing more terrifying than the thought of your drone just falling out of the sky, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, I have multiple stories to tell about that. So um, it just, has... Just give us the best story, you know, yeah, just the best, the best one. The best story. <laughs> um, yeah, I think this was probably um, a project that I was working on in Georgia, which I think um, 
it wasn't very well scoped, um, and we should have we should have looked at it a little bit closer before um, before going to attempt this. Um, there was also some pretty strong winds that day. Mm -hmm. uh, we were flying um, the fixed wing drone, the SenseFly EB, um, so it's super light, made out of styrofoam and whatnot. Um, and it it we sent it on mission. It went up on a ridge line and it hit a thermal, which is um, you know essentially it's a big temperature difference. It's going to cause right. you know wind and movement um, on top of this ridge, and then we just lost communication with the drone. Um, uh oh. And it's supposed to return home after five minutes if you lose communication between the modem and the drone. So we wait five minutes and it didn't come back. And so I was like, okay, well, this is no longer an operations mission. This is a rescue mission and we've got to find our drone. And, uh, you know, so luckily we're all like, you know, quick thinkers and we're, uh, spatially oriented people, geographers. So I looked at the last known coordinates of when we mm -hmm. lost communication with the drone and we plugged that into our phones and then we, we went on a hunt for it. And, um, so we were in a, it was like a private gated community in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Um, and we just kind of start walking around people's backyards looking for this so drone. Trespassing. <laughs> well, we had Georgia. permission from the HOA to be there. Yeah. <laughs> so we wouldn't go as far as saying trespassing. Um, but you know, so we're, we're searching, I mean, it's, it's mountains, it's wooded, mm -hmm. um, and we're just walking around for a little while. We actually did find the body of the drone pretty quickly. I'd say within the first hour, we found the body of the drone. Um, when it hit the thermal, it had overturned. And so it dumped oh. out the sensor, which is, you know, an yeah. expensive piece, right. right? And the battery as well. So we're like, okay, you know, do we just call it quits and mm -hmm. we just leave the sensor out here. We leave the battery, right. you know, get the insurance money. I don't know, but, um, we were pretty determined. So we basically just started doing like, like a foot search for everything. Um, I would say a couple hours later we found the battery. Okay. Um, and then based on where we had found the drone and the battery, we determined the sensor had to be kind of somewhere in the middle of that. And we spent the rest of the day just like walking around looking for it, didn't end up finding it. So we go back the next day and we're walking around again. Um, and this is this is me and my friend Britton from grad school again. So we're walking and, you know, um, he's like super calm under any circumstance. I'm like the anxious one and I'm freaking okay, out. All and, right. You know, I'm like, we're never going to find this thing. And, you know, <laughs> everything's terrible. And um so, you know, like I'm, I'm kind of losing it a little bit and he's like, oh, you know, everything's going to be good. And then we both kind of look up at the same time into the tree above us and the sensor was just <laughs> hanging from the tree right above us. And yeah, I mean, it was like too good to be true. Um, so we, we ended up finding it, um, everything, and we took the drone back and we put it together and it still flew. For years after that. That's solid right I there. I know. That's, yeah. I mean, the EB, that EB has been through a lot. Um, it definitely has had its its share of, you know, run-ins with. I've, I've heard tales of this EB drone yeah. that Dr. Procope has that has been crashed more than one time. And that being obviously an infamous story now. Yes, That's good. absolutely. That's very good. How much do those things run? What are the... $30,000? Um, so the like. drone itself, I want to say, is maybe like 15 ish Okay. Um, but that once you get into the sensors, you know, mm -hmm. that's where you start adding, you know, yeah. thousands of dollars to tens of thousands of dollars more to what you're right. spending on it. Yep. That's not chump change. You no, don't, it's not. You don't want to lose that in the, in the woods somewhere. <laughs> but yeah, she, she definitely got her money out of that one, so. Um. Tell me about uh, your your Instagram, Unmapped Earth. It's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I kind of um, just started doing it, you know, like I was taking pictures, um, looking for a way to share them mm -hmm. uh, with people. Um, and I think Instagram does have a pretty good um, community. Like once you're on there long enough, like whatever, you know, mm -hmm. specific um, niche that you're in, you'll get to know people. So, you know, there's a lot of drone pilots, um, drone photographers, like, 
throughout the country and internationally that I've, I've kind of like talked to and, you know, made internet friends and whatnot. And some of them That's I've cool. actually met in real life, which is, is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, you know, to go, go meet up with people and, you know, you'll go, go take pictures together and whatnot. Um, so I kind of like started doing it for that sort of social aspect and, and sharing the pictures I was taking with people. Um, and over time, um, you know, it's, it's kind of morphed a little bit into a, a bit of a side business for me. I wouldn't in by any means say it's like lucrative, um, or profitable. <laughs> probably, I, I probably lose money on it with what I spend on my equipment. Um, but I do, you know, I have a, a little bit of income coming in from that. Um, so, um, you know, if, if you're pretty familiar with Instagram, like, you know, for a while they are doing the reels bonus mm -hmm. where you could actually get money for posting reels on, oh, okay. um, which they just did away with this month. So <laughs> no longer, um, but that was funding, uh, you know, my subscriptions for like Adobe Lightroom and Photoshop where I'm doing my photo processing. Like I yeah. bought some, you know, smaller pieces of equipment with money I've made from that. Um, recently I've started working with brands, um, doing like product photography, mm -hmm. um, or, you know, travel photography essentially. Um, so I've worked with, uh, like a camper van company and they actually hooked me up with a free van and I went on a trip to Florida with my kids, which was nice. pretty cool. And, you know, did a bunch of photos and videos for them. Um, I've worked with like, a a company that makes gear for cameras, like um, mm -hmm. filters and yeah. and other types of gear, um, some like apparel companies and whatnot. So, um, you know, I've gotten gotten some you know some hookups on some some things, which is nice um, to be able to test out new things that are on the market and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I'd say largely, you know, it's still mostly I'd consider it a hobby. I know some people, you know, are pretty successful and they can make that into a living, but. I kind of like my day job, so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope yeah. so. Uh, what What are some of the things that are emerging um, tech that you're interested in? Doesn't have to be drones, but you know, uh, what are those kind of emerging areas that you think are have ap applicability to what you do and and what you enjoy even? Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, I mean, I think since my my focus largely is on drones and you know surrounding drones. Um, I'm I'm interested to see uh like over time how the sensors become smaller and smaller um and the platforms as well. Um so I think we have been seeing that like this miniaturization of platforms and sensors and your and longer flight times right so you're able mm -hmm. to collect more data, you know, in less time over larger areas and whatnot. Um so I I think that's very cool. Um, I'm also extremely interested as a lot of people are in like the machine learning and artificial intelligence, um, really from, you know, anything on the scientific, you know, data processing side to, you know, just how it's being used in, um, you know, photography, um, or, you know, digital art, whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people are purists, so they won't consider like, <laughs> you know, anything but a pure photograph to be a photograph, but, um, you know, it's being used in photo manipulation and, you know, just generating these really kind of unique images. Um, you know, we've been we've been talking a lot about chat GPT internally, you know, oh, I know yeah. you're a big fan of chat GPT, too. Um, but yeah, I was I was just watching um, South Park the other day and they have a chat GPT episode, which oh, is that's great. Hilarious. And they actually use chat GPT to write the episode, which I thought was like too perfect. Um <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I think just, you know, the prevalence of of AI within society and, you know, really everywhere you look now, it's being used. Right. Um, so it's it's interesting to see, like, how broad we are getting with it. Um, and I know it's scary for a lot of people, right, to just think like machines are out there like doing things yeah. and, and whatnot. Um, I, for I, one, am ready. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I use chat GPT. Every day now. It's an everyday tool for me. Um, I'm all about just offloading some stuff, even even thinking. Yeah. yeah. I mean, not necessarily like hardcore thinking, but hey, I need some some ideas for this. It's great at brainstorming. Uh, I know they just released Chat GPT four and also Microsoft has released uh, what they call Copilot, um, which is basically building Chat GPT throughout their their office suite. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's going to be doing a lot of writing, a lot of that type of brainstorming. It's getting better and better every day. It's 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 pretty insane, and it's kind of interesting to think about that integration of 
um, generative language-based models, AI, AI, and the image stuff. So Absolutely. if you put the two together, yeah, you have something that can essentially write an entire blog with pictures and everything that are 100%, you know, generated from artificial intelligence. So that's cool. What a, is there anything in, in that space that you're interested in? Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've kind of dabbled with it a little bit mm -hmm. for, for images. Um, I think I still would like want to play with it a lot more. Um, have you looked at mid journey? I have, yeah. So I have used mid journey, um, to just do some like really basic functions. Um, I think a lot of those, those engines that are out there now, it's like, you know, you get so many free and then you have to pay for it or right, that's right, usually right. when I'm like, man, eh, do I really want to pay for <laughs> it? You know? Um, but yeah, I mean, I think they're super cool. And if you, if you go on the internet and you see the artwork that people are creating with these, right. I mean, and of course there's this whole debate surrounding like if that really is art or like, what is it? Or did yeah. the artist do it? Or, sure. you know, like, do they deserve credit for that thing? I, I don't know. But, um, you know, I, I think art to me, I mean, it's really, it's whatever you want it to be. Like there's no, you know. There's really no rules for yeah. what art can be. It's all subject to interpretation. There's definitely no and, rules. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I used to work in this government building and I'd go into work every day. And uh, right before I turned down the hallway, there was this giant painting. It was art. It was just an orange square that somebody clearly had painted with a paintbrush. I could see the brush lines, but it's just an orange square. And every day I'd think, Hmm. Somebody thought that was art, you know? So if, <laughs> if that can be art, then anything can be art. You Absolutely. Know? Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's kind of where I'm at, you know, and um, like photographers get into it a lot, right? With like, mm -hmm. even using Photoshop on your photo, like some people are like, that's not a photo anymore. Like that you're not yeah. a photographer. Like if you do that, you know? Um, and I just think it's crazy. I mean, whatever you want to call it, you know, mm -hmm. if you want to be like a purist or, or whatever, but I mean, uh, art, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder, as they say. And if, if you create something and it speaks to somebody right. or it speaks to you, um, you know, I think, I think that's a large piece of it as well as that process, you know, and if that, if somebody enjoys that process of, you know, using like mid journey to create these images or, you know, using chat GPT to like do some writing for them right. and like use that as a starting point. Um, and that's encouraging people to, you know, pursue these creative hobbies or, you know, yeah. turn I that think the hobbies and all that stuff are cool from a legal aspect though. You know, if I create these 100 pictures that I hand drew, right. And then some developer just takes them, uses them to train his model, and then spits out all this new artwork. Who who really made that art? You know, yeah, it's right. it's it's definitely a, a sticky situation. And I think we're massively behind the eight ball on where this is going in terms of regulation. Um, ChatGPT isn't even connected to the internet, right? It's using data from 2021 right now that at least the part that's publicly publicly accessible what what happens when it starts scraping all the websites every day right and then continuing to build its model um now anyone that's ever written a blog article right they're not getting there's no incentive to write a blog article anymore right because mm -hmm. now it's just it's being scraped and that information is being served to someone and you're completely cutting out that author who originally created it. So I think the legal aspects to it are absolutely insane and we're way behind absolutely. where it's going. Uh, I don't even think it's a thought in the minds of the, the legislature, you know? No, so. I, I don't, I don't think it is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it is. I mean, right. Like we're talking about, you know, chat GPT being used in schools and like the implications yeah. that has for the students who are using it and, you know, what, what do teachers need to do to, you know, find out if their students are cheating or whatever. But right. but like beyond that at a larger like legislative level, I, I feel like yeah, people are, are, like you said, not focused on it yet. I, I said it earlier um, in the year, but I believe 2023 is the year of AI. It's the year we really dig in to see these things used across the board in multiple applications. We've had things that, you know, 
people have said are AI that aren't really AI. And of course, these language models aren't necessarily, you know, general uh, intelligence, right? Uh, but it's the first year where I think people are really accessing this stuff and they're really using it in their everyday life. So I think it's just going to get, it's going to get crazier. Absolutely. I think it's, but I like it. It's fun. It's, it's been made <laughs> it's cool accessible to, to the public. Right? right. And whereas before it was like, you know, nerds with computers were like, they were the only yeah. people that had access to it really. Um, and now like a normal person can just go access uh -huh. this stuff. And yeah, no, it's, it's really seeing the growth over the past few years. I mean, I took a machine learning AI class when I was in grad school in, mm -hmm. you know, 2017, 2018. And, you know, not at that point, not even really being super familiar with it to now, mm -hmm. like everybody's kind of familiar with it. You know, if, even if they don't understand, you know, how yeah. a deep learning model works or, you know, a neural network, what that is or whatnot, right. like they still understand what these things can do. Yeah. I think, I think we need to start integrating this into grade school curriculum because think about kids in grade school right now by the time they graduate if you don't know how to leverage ai you're just going to be behind the, the curve right you're going to be uh, yesterday's news as they say yeah um which is crazy to think about for me because you know i didn't even have a computer until i was in middle school so mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> you there know you go. now it's like kids are just started learning on computers you know when they're in pre-k basically and right. you know now it's like where else do we go to keep them up to speed with pace of the world at this point yeah i, I remember distinctly um uh, being in middle school and our teacher wouldn't let us use the calculator on the test she's like well you're not just gonna have a calculator everywhere you go uh, and now it's, of course, we have a supercomputer in our pocket. But I think that same way with AI now, right? It's like, no, 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 you can't use chat GPT on this test. You're not going to have AI anywhere you go. Yes, you are. Yeah, pretty soon we will. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have it on your face, on the glasses. Uh, it's just, it's anyways, it's really cool to think about. Um, you talked about uh, the DGI Mavic. You talked about um, we talked about Skydio a little bit. What are some of the other drone companies out there? Maybe we haven't discussed, or maybe people don't even know about. Um, so I think I think one like on the fixed wing side that people are looking at a lot is the Wingtra. Um, Wingtra, okay. And and that one's kind of cool because it's um, what's called a VTOL or vertical takeoff and landing, mm -hmm. uh, whereas like the EB is a fixed wing as well, but that kind of needs you need a you know, runway. A, 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 yeah, it needs to ascend, whereas um, the Wingtra can it just can go up, um, so you can you know, start from a more confined area. Um, I think that's a cool aspect about that drone. Um, and I mean, even the Skydio, I know, you know, you were saying like for the data collection aspect, maybe they haven't, um, you know, reached their potential there yet. But um, some of the cool things that I've noticed about that um, more from like a photography or like hobby perspective is the tracking mm -hmm. and collision avoidance on that drone um, yeah. is definitely superior to DJI drones. Um, so DJI does have uh, like a tracking function, but if you, you know, are too close to like being underneath the drone, it basically loses you. Right, um, right. Whereas, Skydio, I mean, you could be riding a mountain bike through like heavy forests and not only will it track you the entire time, it won't run into any trees or anything. Yeah, that's wild. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just like seeing the way that you could use that. Um, and, you know, people are always asking me for like recommendations on like, oh, what drone do I buy? What should I get? And, um, you know, it's kind of like, well, what do you want to do with it? Because if you're like a really like active, mm -hmm. you know outdoor oriented and you're like doing all these like extreme sports like that would probably be the way i would go with that you know like i i'm not doing that stuff so much so i mm -hmm. like the D, the djis i think they've you know they've kind of cornered the market on the the photography industry um but every day i mean there's there's you know new innovations that are coming out and so i'm just excited to you know keep, keep up with it in the future and yeah you know spend all my spare money on drones of course it's <laughs> <laughs> that's the way it yeah. goes so if, if if you're just getting into drones what would be 
one that you recommend for anyone that maybe wants to do photography? Yeah. Um, so I was kind of get, like give options based on the price range because um, right. some people don't want to spend three grand on the Mavic 3. Um, if you can, I definitely would go that way. Um, but there's also the the Air 2S, I think, is the mm -hmm. newest model. Um, and that's really great. It's a little bit smaller, lower price tag. Um or the mini three, which is mm -hmm. like, you could basically fit it in your pocket. Like I want one just cause it's like super right. cute. You know, I could put it in my purse and take it with me places. <laughs> a drone is an accessory. The, well, yeah. I, I actually, I do put, I carry my Mavic three in my purse pretty regularly, but, um, you know, it's a little bulky. So like I could have like a backup travel drone. You just got a big um, purse, right? You're yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, on that, it was funny cause I went to a conference recently and I, forgot to bring my business cards with me, which totally makes sense. And, uh, you know, so I was talking to someone there. I said, oh, I'd give you my business card, but I forgot to bring it. And he's like, you forgot your business cards, but I noticed you have a drone in your purse. Like, <laughs> I'm like, well, that doesn't tell you my priorities. I don't know what will, but yeah, uh, yeah, no, I mean, there's just, you know, there, there's something for every budget out there. Mm -hmm. You know, DJI is normally what I recommend on the photography yep. side. Um, but, but again, like I was saying, if you're like a very like action sports oriented mm -hmm. person, I'd do the Skydia. Or if you're, you know, very keen on getting something that's U.S. made, um, you know, and you want to not do the the foreign made, the Skydia also, you know, fits right. that bill perfectly. Okay, very good, very good. Um, what about somebody that maybe wants to get started in a professional setting? You know, you talk about mapping, mm -hmm. um, topography, you know, somebody that maybe they're starting a company or they're working with their company. They want to launch a drone program. How, how would they get started in that? Absolutely. Yeah. I think there's, there's probably a lot of answers to that. Um, but it, Definitely depends on what you want to do specifically with it, um, because there's a lot of uses for drones where I don't think you need to have a degree um, in order to do that. Um, but once you're, you know, getting into more uh, things that require like high accuracy, high precision, um, having an understanding of, you know, how how these measurements are actually taken and, you know, mm -hmm. how that applies to the real world. Um, you know, so like having a degree in geomatics or something like that, which is literally, you know, studying, measuring the earth, um, right. I think is, is necessary in a lot of cases. Um, and there are some schools, you know, that have drone specific degrees as mm -hmm. well, where, um, you know, you could, you could get a degree that would enable you to use drones for mapping and data collection, or maybe you want to build the drones themselves, um, or right. the sensors. Um, so I think that's another avenue that people can, can go to, but yeah, I mean, so I would say, you know, you have to pick, pick whatever use you want and, you know, you can't just say, oh, I want to like, I want to do drones. I'm interested in drones and I'm just going to be very broad. I think you need to yeah. narrow in on what you want. And then you need to figure out, like, does this require me to have a special certification, a degree, mm -hmm. whatnot, um, and kind of go from there and then, you know, figure out which models of yeah. drones would be best, which sensors are you going to need? So it's kind of a whole a whole process. Um, and then certainly the, you know, legal regulation aspect. Right. Get your 107 um, <laughs> as well. <laughs> Why not, right? Yeah, you know? absolutely. Every, everyone's getting a 107. I know, you know? it's what, $165 yeah, or yeah, something yeah. like that. So, <laughs> yes. Um, you, you brought up a good point, which is, uh, you know, you kind of have to pick your lane because there's so many different, I mean, we talked about a lot of the different things you can do. We talked about precision agriculture. We talked about topography, you know, photography, um, photogrammetry, those sorts of things. Uh, and a lot of times people will hit me up and they'll say, Hey, you know, my buddy's interested in drones. Can he talk to you? I'm like, of, of course, you know, I'm not a drone expert by any means. I never claim to be. Um, but then their, their thought is, you know, Hey, I got this drone. I want to go take some pictures. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, that's great. You know, I've, I don't know if I can, I'm the right person to help you. But. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard. I think when people are trying to you know, figure out where they can fit in because there's so many options mm -hmm. out there. And, um, you know, I've, I've mentored people over the years and, you know, recently was just, um, talking with, with, uh, someone locally from Wilmington who she's been flying for a mm -hmm. while, but she's interested in kind of commercializing that, um, you know, and she's like, 
I was thinking about the construction industry, but then I was thinking about this other thing. I was thinking about this. Thing, and I'm like, okay, well, you got to pick one, right? Like right. pick something you're interested in. If you're already certified, you have a drone, say you want to do construction, like call up a construction mm -hmm. company, say, hey, can I come out and take some pictures, some videos and give you some free products, you know, right? see how you like them. Give me some feedback. Um, because then, you know, you're, you're starting to create a portfolio basically. So mm -hmm. if you do them, they look great. You get good feedback. Now you have something you can market to other people. Well, right? now we know why these places want to do it for so cheaply because, you know, people start now that are developing their portfolio, doing it for free. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's kind of like, you know, but do you want to go in there and say, oh, I'll do this project for $400 and, you know, it's kind uh -huh. of like garbage. Um, or, you know, maybe the, the construction company doesn't know that they wanted drone photos in the right. first place. Like maybe they don't realize mm -hmm. how cool that would be to have like, you know, a time lapse video of their construction yeah. site or just aerial photos to use for planning or or whatever. Um, so Security. I think, yeah. That's a big deal. A lot of these construction sites, they have a problem with security people go out there and steal their equipment because they just <laughs> they just leave it out there which i've always thought was crazy i know right they'll yeah. just oh, we'll just leave the tractor here we'll yep. just leave the <laughs> i know like he's in the ignition this, it's ready to know, go <laughs> hundred hundred thousand dollars worth of steel we'll just leave it over here yep you know yeah I don't nothing know. bad could happen right they're they're very very confident in that way <laughs> but yeah yeah i've never i've never quite understood that so i think that's a you know security is a great use case um for drone stuff uh, what are some other maybe creative or innovative ways that you, you could use a drone, um, either for business, personal reasons, uh, anything that you've seen or experienced? Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, for business, I mean, I think logically, like a lot of a lot of companies could use them for marketing. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. I mean, okay. developing, you know, photos and videos that can be used for marketing material. Of course, you have to have someone who knows how to fly it and is part 107 certified. Right. Yep. So that's like always the caveat, because a lot of people say even like on construction sites, they're like, oh, I have this drone. and I just use it to like take pictures and like check things out mm -hmm. sometimes. And it's like, well, do you have your 107? Commercial purpose. No, yeah. they don't. You know, so so a lot of people are just using them mm -hmm. commercially and they're, you know. Technically, they shouldn't be, I guess. Um, but, you know, on the personal side, I mean, I feel like everybody needs to have a drone now for like if you like to travel or whatever right. or, you know, you just want to document things like a little bit differently. I mean, I love taking pictures. Um, so I pretty much always have it with me, um, you know, when I'm going on trips, even overseas, um, you know, being able to have those different perspectives and you know see things differently like mm -hmm. down here on the coast even you know everything's very flat so it's not like in the mountains you get like you know these great views of everything down here you can right. really have no idea what most of the terrain looks like because you're you mm -hmm. know eye level with it but you put the drone up in the air and you see it see it differently you know i think that's um you know, probably my, my favorite personal use of them. Um, but I think it's really limitless, you know, as to, as to what people can do. I mean, there's obviously like drone racing, you know, mm -hmm. FPV and there stuff like go. that, which like, I've never gotten into the FPV yet. Maybe I will. Um, I feel like I get motion sick kind of easy, so I don't know right. if it's for me, but, um, and the drone racing, like I would just crash it, but, um, you know, people that have like drone racing mm -hmm. leagues and, you know, so there's so many, just cool different ways. Like if right. you're not into photography, but you still want to fly a drone, mm -hmm. I mean, go do drone racing or like the FPV stuff is yeah. like just fun to be flying through open windows and buildings and, you know, yeah. all kinds of flips and stuff. <laughs> yeah, I have the DJI Avada. It's pretty neat. Uh, Avatar, Avada, whatever. Yeah, I don't. However you really say sure. it. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, you put the You put the goggles on and the controller is actually just in the air it's just like you just hold it like this um which takes some getting used to um but the first time i flew it i flew it over my house and it was pretty neat because you know you're you're looking through the goggles and it's like you're flying as close to flying as as can be anyways Absolutely. so it's actually pretty cool um pretty cool technology uh well carrie we've been chatting for a while is there anything else you'd like to leave us with oh gosh yeah i don't know i mean i just say if you, you know if you're interested in drones and you've thought about trying it out you know i definitely recommend it um mm -hmm. you know i think 
especially, you know, for the younger generations, it's a very up and coming technology. Um, you know, from my personal standpoint, like I am a very big advocate for females getting into the drone industry, um, which is something I haven't really touched on. But um, in the U.S., only about 8% of commercial mm -hmm. pilots, uh, drone pilots are female. Um, so, you know, we have a huge gap to, to fill there. Um, and I, for years, I've been an ambassador with a group called uh, Women Who Drone. Um, and, you know, they are uh, advocating for and promoting women in the drone industry. Um, and I think it's just a great space to be in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's uh, there's so many avenues, you know, you could you could go down there um, and, you know, really just to everybody, encourage them to, you know, get into it if that's what you want to do. Well, cool, cool. Uh, check out the description. We'll have some information about Carrie in there and links to her Instagram. It's called Unmapped Earth. Earth. Unmapped Earth, right? Did I say that right? Uh, <laughs> definitely check that out. And uh, make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcast. And thanks for joining us. This is The NDS Show.